Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second day of March meeting 2021, Unraveling the Present. It is my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Francoise Vergès, who will discuss how platforms bringing together artists, activists, and scholars can contribute to thinking historically in the present. The keynote will be conf configured as a palimpsest of memories, images, and histories of struggle. This is the first out of four keynotes taking place over the 10-day program of this year's March meeting. Vergez is an author, public educator, and decolonial feminist who has written extensively on the vernacular practices of memory, slavery, and the economy of predation, European colonialism, colonial and post-colonial psychiatry, Franz Fanon, Amy César, post-colonial museography, and the roots of migration and processes of creolization in the Indian Ocean. She is currently consulting professor at the Center for Cultural Studies, Goldsmiths, University of London in the UK, and research associate at La Collage d'Etudes Mondiales in Paris, France. She is also the president of Le Comité pour la Mémoire et l'Histoire d'Esclavage. She was a project advisor for Documenta 11 in 2002 and contributed to the third edition of La Triennale in Paris in 2012. I would like to quickly remind everyone that there is simultaneous Arabic interpretation of this session available on the link provided in the chat box. The link will redirect you to the session Zoom webpage from where you can select the Arabic language option. Without, any, without further delay, I would like to welcome Francoise to present her keynote. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thank you very much. And I'm very, very honored to be part of the distinguished uh, speakers. Dismantling the Master House. This is a title of my intervention. On January 5th, 2019, 5.5 million women constructed side by side a wall was 620 kilometer long from the north to the south of the state of Kerala to protest by the misogynistic and ethno nationalist measure of the Modi government. Last year in Chile, feminists said, we will not return to normal because normal was the problem. Around the world, normal is being challenged normal meaning the abnormal, the norms of the master. Women have been at the forefront of the struggle against the naturalized abnormal. In Argentina for five years now, the Ni Una Menos, not one less, movement has filled the street demanding no more math and math, stop killing us. In Mexico, they are attacking the fortress of patriarchal power. In Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Lebanon, South Africa, Poland, France, Spain, Egypt, Palestine, Myanmar, women are leading strikes, marching in the street against their exploitation and oppression. Their condition has gotten worse with the pandemic. All studies point to the fact that women will bear its heavier social and economic burden. Indeed, nearly 40% of all women employed globally work in the four most affected industries by the pandemic, hotel, restaurant, retail, and manufacturing. They account for more than 75% of all unpaid care work in the world. They constitute the majority of workers in the cleaning industry and notably in social services, 90% of them. And with girls, they dedicate roughly 12.5 billion hours to unpaid work every day. Due to the overload of domestic work, 42% of women in the world are excluding, excluded from the labor market, compared to only 6% of men. The wealth, comfort, and health of the master rests on the invisible and underpaid work of racialized women on patriarchy, racism, slavery, exploitation, looting, forced labor, exhaustion and depletion of lives and of earth. It is therefore not surprising that attack on the master households are increasing, notably in the current expansion of right-wing ideologies, racism, enduring settler colonialism, and all kinds of calamities. And without surprise, the master is responding with terror, violence, murder, surveillance and control. The expression dismantling the master house is of course taken from the famous remark Audre Lorde made in 1984. The full paragraph reads, and I quote, 
Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society definition of acceptable woman, those of us who have been forged in the crucible of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbian, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to make our differences and make them strengths. For the master tools, we'll never dismantle the master house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. In a clear, concise paragraph, Lord described the master house as a house of racist patriarchy and racist feminism, cleaned by women of color who take care of his children while his wife goes shopping or to feminist conferences. Its architecture and the world he built and which built it were based on a series of rules. Who could live inside, who was recruited to make the master life possible and comfortable, but whose work should be made invisible so to never disturb his days and night or sense of existence. Lord insisted on the leap of imagination required to create the tools needed to demonstrate it. It means not stopping at arrangement, at being accepted in the corridor or in the corner of the dining room, but to build solidarity, relationality, political belonging, and to nurture utopian thinking in the world of dystopia that the master house had produced. It, is, it was to know with certainty that behind the permanent state of war, the survival of the master house demanded, there is always the possibility of peace, peacefulness, and relationality. Among the strategies developed to dismantle the master house, we have the miraculous weapon, les armes miraculeuses, that Aimé Césaire defended, language and poetry, but also the song, the poem, the declaration, the art, the craft, the ritual, the insurrection, the revolution, the rebellion, the philosophies, the dream of freedom, mockery, marooning, processes of creation, insurrection, revolt, revolution, protecting community, making kin of and family outside of heteronormativity, development of pedagogy and feminism, who are all fighting for humanizing the world. Indigenous resistance, slaves revolt, the Asian revolution, the struggle for civic right, for independence, the marches against feminicide in the Americas, the mobilization against negrophobia and Islamophobia, against land safe in Africa, the Americas and Asia, for democracy and people's right in Palestine, North Africa, Southeast Asia and beyond. The platform alliance around the world have created a decolonial archive that sustain imagination and utopian thinking. There will be no dismantling the master house until the right to breathe to breathe is included as a central element in the struggle for justice and dignity, and until depatriarchalization becomes now more than ever a key element in the struggle for humanizing the world. I will speak rapidly about the origin of the master house and its world and compare the world it created and upon which it depended with, with the current world and come back to the tool for dismantling it. I'm not suggesting an unchanged spatial and cultural arrangement, but the existence of a form of an architecture that connect different nodes of power and whose wealth is based on the economy of extraction and exhaustion. It is a world that produces enormous amount of suffering, enormous amount of wasted land and wasted lives. Its power rests on pacification, neutralization and terror, on the interdiction of making kin, of making community and family. It was leave behind traumas and mental suffering that last through generation, as well as tons of junk with, polluting, with pollution lingers for generation. It laws of protection of women and children and for the division between those who deserve protection and those who do not. The process of unchilding, which Palestinian legal scholar Nadira Shaloub Kervorkian described as, I quote, the understanding of children as political capital in the end of those in power, the political work of violence designed to create, direct, govern, transform, and construct colonized children as dangerous, as racialized other, 
enabling their eviction from the real or childhood itself has become global. The master house is no longer exclusively found in the global north. It is replicated all over in the enclave for the wealthy that we find in cities throughout the world, in plantation, in the sheer logic of extraction exhaustion, and in patriarchy. Thinking about historically in the present means defining what we call the present, which should not be conf confused with the contemporary. It is a position in the way Michel Ralph Trouillot look at pastness rather than the past. It is a field of practice that impact on the way in which we conceive reparative justice and the humanization of the world, what can be repaired from the past and what is irreparable, what must be repaired in the present and in the present for the future, because the economy of extraction exhaustion is already threatening the condition of living of future generation. So now the master house in history. In the master house live the man, capital M. A man who claimed to stand for the whole humanity and who represent, I quote, itself as if it were the human itself, as philosopher Sylvia Winter has written. A man whose function, who function as a normative and unquestioned category of existence anchoring educational philosophy and theory in the global north, as Winthrop continues. The struggle between the ethnoclass man, what she called the ethnoclass man, and the human, which is still to come, can be seen, I quote, in all our present struggle with respect to race, class, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, struggle over the environment, global warming, se severe cl climate change, and the sharply unequal distribution of the Earth's resources. It wealth and capital were based on the attraction and exhaustion of labor and resources. In the mine of gold and silver, and the plantation of sugar, tobacco, cotton, coffee, and indigo, in the depletion of forests of precious wood, which led to reorganization of the world economy and the impoverishment of Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas, starting in the 15th century. And then again, the extraction and exhaustion of rubber, of wealth oil, of coal, of guano, of pearls, and now of uranium, old, cobalt, or nickel. To mine gold and silver, slavery, colonial slavery, mine, indigenous and black human energy and life force to death. Extraction required terror, torture, the exhaustion in body until premature death, the exploitation of plant, mine, forest, bodies of water, animal and earth. The flesh and bones of indigenous and black dead body mixed with the hearse of plantation and mine. They were the humus of capitalism. Kidnapping and rape became indispensable to that economy. Indeed, without a rape and the capitalization of the black woman's womb, the master house would have collapsed. As Christine Sharp has written, slavery, I quote, turned the womb into a factory producing blackness as abjection, much like the slave ship hoard and the prison. In the world where the black body was capital, where work was made cheap, nature was also made cheap. There, for the enjoyment and the profit of the master. In a billion black Anthropocene or known, speaking of Ghana, of the Gold Coast, Catherine Yusuf described a historical moment of extraction and exhaustion that she said is, I quote, the transformation of mineralogy of the earth in the extraction of gold, silver, salt, and copper to the massive transformation of ecology in the movement of plant, people, plants, and animals across territories, coupled with the intensive implantation of monoculture of indigo, tobacco, cotton, sugar, and other alien ecology in the new world. The global economy of extraction exhaustion shaped the way white and non-white life and environment were conceived. The master house was deeply patriarchal, yet private property and whiteness could overpower male domination. Indeed, in European colony, white women who were constructed as docile and fragile in need of their father's brother or husband protection 
were in fact very savvy in skill when it came to the commerce in flesh. Since they more often inherited slave than land, they understood, as historian Stephanie John Rogers has shown, that enslaved women were their private capital, their property, and they were careful to deprive their husband of power over that capital. White women showed no hesitation to enter the slave mar market, to bargain, to sell and borrow, without demonstrating any innate female sense of empathy. The gender binary that European states sought to impose was never as rigid as it pretended to be. True, as Maria Luganes has shown, coloniality was gendered. It criminalized sexualities, imposed rigid forms of masculinity and femininity that disrupted local arrangement. But if it, if it enforced gender boundary, it also banned them when the master interest was at stake. And slave women were forced to work as hard as men in the field, were punished as brutally as men, were forced to give birth in the field, and had no days off for nurturing their newborn child, were made into sexual objects, but were required to show female tenderness and affection to the master children and wife. And this we can see it again today, also with this difference in, I mean, this both the deep gendering and engendering. The fields of white patriarchy was hidden behind the romance of chivalry. The master house was not the house of gallantry and cultured manners that Fleeman novels have depicted, but of horrors and cruelty. Yet the master house was also constructed as a domain of cleanliness, of manners and civilization, standing apart from the unclean world of non-white. Europe, said the colonial narrative, was a cradle of cleanliness and hygiene, two key elements in the making of the discourse of superior civilization. However, when crusaders invaded Palestine in the 12th century, Arabs, Arabs were astonished and horrified by their disregard for personal cleanliness. Later, when Europeans debark in Africa, Asia, and the American, natives could not also believe that human beings could be so indifferent to their own hygiene. Nonetheless, by the 19th century, European had traced a strong racial divide between a clean Europe, clean European bodies versus dirty indigenous dwelling, dirty body, unhealthy sexual abuse, sorry, lack of self-care, and, and lack of self-care, sorry. The plantation was the domain of the master house, the historical form in which the extraction of life, of human and non-human life was organized on an industrial scale for the production of commodities and profit. Private property was key and became intimately connected with patriarchy and inheritance. The plantat plantationocene had long distant impact. It affected taste and manners in colonizing society. It disturbed even climate, which a young uh, uh, man has argued and I quote, has always been a project for colonial power, which have continually acted to engineer it. Though the impact of shaping the environment would be fully assessed only much later, and we already, I mean, we're still uh, feeling it even from centuries, uh, you know, uh, back of uh, slavery and colonization. Since as environmental historian Joachim Renko has shown, and I quote, the chief problem of colonialism seems to have been not so much its immediate ecological consequence as its long-term impact, the full impact of which become apparent only centuries later in the era of modern technology and many times only after the colonial state has acquired the independence. The plantation was linked to banks insurance, stock market, arms, industry, international law, tribunal, the church, and to the world making of modernity, that geography, botany, travel diaries, and later photography, ethnology, and cinema constructed. It were, its world, the world of the master house, was limited and limitless. If the borders of the plantation were severely enforced for the enslaved, the master needed to have access to the larger world. It would not have survived without global connection. It was dependent of the domination and militarization of the seas, carefully organized by European power. And we can think then, you know, the Treaty of Utrecht, for instance, which were the first instance in 1713. Without the development of maritime power, no slave trade, no colonial commerce, no colonialism, no imperialism, 
no wars of conquest. Rivers, lakes, seas, and oceans were instrumental for colonial exploration and conquest. Europe named seas, rivers, and ocean and map, and map the maritime world. Colonial slavery and post-slavery imperialism constructed a land-sea continuum of power, which erased the understanding by non-European people of the land-water continuum, the link these people made between land, river, lake, shores, seas, and ocean, of which we can find so many examples in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. The master house in the 21st century and its world still rests on the extraction and exhaustion and on terror. To think its world historically in the present, I will focus on the necessary work of cleaning, caring, both for me or intertwined, for the continuation of the master house, but also on the fact that its tone of accumulated decay has almost made impossible the full cleaning of the planet. On the one hand, without the necessary but invisible and underpaid work of cleaning and caring by black and brown women, neoliberal and patriarchal capitalism will not function. On the other, since capitalism is a production of waste rather than good, the task is endless. West, Fred Madgoff and Chris William have written is, I quote, a sign of capitalism success. And according to, even to the World Bank, 16% of the world population, I mean the population of high income country, generate a third of the annually 2.1 billion ton of solid waste. Women who clean and care, whether they live in Maputo, Rio de Janeiro, London, Riyadh, Kuala Lumpur, New York, Rabat, or Paris, all speak of being exhausted. Mining to exhaustion, the body of migrant of a racialized people. And when I say racialized, I, I do understand that the process of racialization occur as well in the country of the global south, right? Filipinas and Indonesian women racialized in Southeast Asia, Thai and Malagashi in Beirut and, and etc. So this mining is global. Of course, black and brown male body are also used and abused to clean the ton of excess of neoliberal ravage. But dismantling the foundation of the master house could start by depriving it of being clean and cared for every day. And this can be done first and foremost by women. Indeed, strike by cleaning, caring women all over the world in recent years and currently have been central in that struggle. So this is not about sharing domestic duties, but about transforming the world. Black and brown women lives are allowed in the master house, but by the back door. They enter the gate of the city of its control building as phantom. They circulate in the city, but only as an airways present. In the current reworking of the geopolitics of cleanliness, dirtiness, the invisibility of the cleaning job of women of color creates the visibility of clean home and public space that then can be exhibited in journals and uh, and design. Men, the other number of surplus community, either also obtain a pass to fulfill essential job in the city, or they must stay behind the gates, otherwise they risk being killed by the police or by private armed guard. New border between cleanliness and dirtiness are being traced in an age in which interest is growing for clean air, clean water, clean house, clean body, clean mind and clean nature. Concern for green economy, hygiene, health and protection have been reinforced by the COVID-19 pandemic. Historically, warning about hygiene and health when traveling to this country have contributed to the construction of a clean world versus an unclean world populated by unclean people. Nowadays, image of dirty street, dirty river, dirty beaches, dirty neighborhood, of plastic covering, uh, of plastic, oh, sorry, of field of plastic, of women, children, and men searching through mountain of garbage or pushing cart filled with refuse, of children swimming in polluted water in the global south or in poor neighborhood of the north, contribute to the creation of a naturalized division between dirty and clean. To this proliferation of image, report by international agency and NGOs alert on the alarming level of plastic, rate of disease and pollution in this country, hard also to this idea. With COVID-19, the global South is represented again as a repository of deadly viruses, 
threatening the entire planet. And even though studies have shown that calamity are caused by neoliberalism, deforestation, megaform, the privatization of earth services and poverty, the new geopolitic of clean dirty is borrowing from the old borders, separating area of dirtiness characterized by disease, unsustainable birth rate, violence against women, crime and lawlessness, and areas of cleanliness where the master house stand, which are heavily policed and where children can safely play, women can walk freely at night, and street can be closed to traffic, to a shopping and dining outside. With this accumulation of image of report, the feeling that cleaning that world is an impossible task is slowly ingrained. What well, become then a pressing issue for wealthy country is how to keep externalized pollution from breaching clean areas. A black geography of dumping show then the ingrained structural and systemic violence of racial capitalism. The world of the master house still extends beyond the limit of the plantation or of the urban enclave. Hegemony upon rivers, ocean, and sea are still of utmost importance, and seas, rivers, ocean, lake are still the site of intense competition, of growing appropriation, militarization, extraction, and pollution. Where the railroad was to the 19th century imperialist expansion, port and tankers are to the 21st century, as 90% of global trade is still done with ship. 70% of oil consumed globally goes through the ocean, and 98% of digital communication is made through underwater cable. In a fascinating account of shipping and capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula, Lale Khalili shows how commodity capitalism has deeply affected navigation, social life and work, and how much it has externalized pollution, I quote. So much has been changed in that space where land and sea meet. So many shorelines shifted, seabed lifted, hills leveled, and, and, and lands claim that very little remain of the coastline that fishermen, purse divers, sailors, and merchants of the 18th or even 19th century could recognize. With this change, natural habitat and geography have also been decimated. Today, dredging, destruction of mangrove, of mudflat, of marine ecosystem, and extraction of sand, which is one of the world's biggest traded commodities by volume, contribute to the exhaustion and extraction of community and environment. Uh, 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 sorry, on the, on the rims. Rivalry over access to certain bodies of water to gain commercial or strategic advantage have intensified. For the US Navy, and I quote here uh, an admiral, uh, a US admiral, national zone of exclusivity, you know, this, this uh, part of water that belongs to the nation, will never inevitably expand, and I quote, even further into the ocean until they meet in the middle, creating a no man's land or rather no man's sea, where both sides venture only at grave peril. After a century in which freedom of maneuver was the norm in naval operation, much of the ocean would be carved up into impassable killing field, end quote. And this is already happening in the Mediterranean, part of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Island, artificial or natural, are transformed into military base or prison camp for refugees. I'm thinking, you know, about the island that the Greek government, where, where in fact military dictatorships and political prisoners are now the island where they are looking refugee, or the island of Nauru in the Pacific, where Australia is looking, you know, is imprisoning refugee, or the island of Basanchar, where Bangladesh is saying, sending Rohingya refugee. But these are, you know, also the, the island as a military fortress, and in the Indian Ocean, the island of Diego Garcia is far more secretive even than Guantanamo Bay and has been a major launch pad for the US attack on Afghanistan and Iraq. It supports some of the largest US airplane. But we have to map out what's happening, if I, we still talk about the Indian Ocean, of including in new players like India, China, and Australia, remapping borders on the sea, on water. 
The master house are always enforce rules to limit circulation, I say. It financed militia and maroon center. It created laws that forbid black and brown presence outside of enclosed neighborhood. A black geography showed the ingrained structural and systemic racism that governed the circulation of black and brown body whose transgression is then severely punished. Migrant and refugee today would challenge the master borders are threatened with death. Whereas young Western women and men have been encouraged to travel and discover the world, to find oneself through the journey abroad, whose travel diary have become even classic, young African, Asian, or South American are denied their right to circulation and their desire for autonomy, even more so if they are women. If they succeed, they are forced to take illicit job in a society which both reject and demean them. They are forced to live in a space of unfreedom. But migrants often refuse to see themselves only as victim. They perceive themselves as the true adventurers of the 21st century who demonstrate courage, bravery, and audacity. In, an, in a, a book, An Archipelago of Solidarity, philosopher Christian Volarch recalled how a group of young Senegalese and Cameroonian who were caught into, in a Greek uh, island laughed when she asked them about the difficulty they had endured. They first took her to task about her country racism, uh, Volaire is French, and then say that they saw themselves as travelers who had overcome huge danger and obstacle thanks to their courage, their endurance, and their friendship. Their narrative demonstrated collectivity making in the making and belonging in practice. Similarly, many of the African women migrants interviewed by sociologist Camille Scholl in The Wretch of the Sea, but in French, I mean, it's, it's uh, Les Danes uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the feminine, in the feminine, sorry, Les Danes de la Mer, you know, like, of course, playing on the Wretch of the Earth, refused to be seen as victim and challenged in NGOs and state norms which want to transform them into passive and defenseless women to be saved. This is not to undermine the suffering, the trauma, and the mental health problem of migrant, but to say that those who escape the master house know what marooning entails. They know also that the long-standing maritime tradition enshrined in international law to render assistance to those in distress at sea with the regard to, without regard to their nationality, status, or the circumstance in which they are found has been criminalized and that their lives are made cheap. Bonaventure Shoth Bejung Nidgung has said that we are living a humanity crisis and not a migrant crisis. And this narrative shows that it is true. So dismantling the master house in the present cannot be a land-based project only. It has to include a decolonization of the West, Western continuum land and sea, a reappropriation of the philosophy of living that, that have conceived this continuum land and sea and that conceive Earth as a living connected world. Around the world, younger ma masters have learned to speak the vocabulary of sustainable development of gender equality, human rights, and biodegradable commodity. They are even ready to concede some rights to their workers, so they still sign contract with private militia or logistic security companies to enforce the rules of extraction exhaustion when needed. In the plantation today, terror still rules. As global demand for basic, basic agricultural products have increased, and even more so the, uh, since the pandemic, to answer the need of human and animal alimentation, but also of textile and other industry, agro-extractivist capitalism, as Alberto Alonso Fraredas has called it, is expanding. And the vast plantation of sugar, palm oil, soy, or a cabbage, this for the paper industry, are you know, growing in Africa, Asia, and South America. Testimony by women who work in this plantation are about rape and systemic and structural violence. This is what Sayak Valencia has described as the age of go capitalism. In other words, I quote, the many instances of dismembering and disobedient often tied to organized crime, gender, and the predatory use of body which possess this incredible kind of violence as tool of necro empowerment. Valencia reminds us that dismembered women bodies are thrown in garbage dump in Mexico, 
illustrating the connection patriarchy and gop capitalism are making between female bodies and garbage. Rape, forced labor, extraction, exhaustion, and suffocation are deeply connected. The struggle for the right to breathe is not only a struggle against police violence, tear gas and bombs, but also against what is making the air irrespirable. According to the World Health Organization, more people are dying every day of polluted air than of any other cause. Ocean dead zone with zero oxygen have quadrupled in size since 1950, and the number of very low oxygen sites near coast have multiplied tenfold. Forests are burning, shore are disappearing, islands are drowning, and level upon level of waste are, are, sorry, are asphyxiating the earth and people. But what makes the world ir irrespirable is not just polluted air, it is also authoritarian, autocratic rule, censorship, prison, repression of activists, artists, intellectual, of stifling joy and liveness. Among the numerous strategies for dismantling the master house, and I have cited some, the women's strike as both a concept and a collective experience is transforming the boundary of politics as we know it. Developed by feminists in the global thoughts and by Latins, Blacks and decolonial feminists, the women's strike bind together struggle around production and social reproduction and better reflect and articulate an increasingly feminized and rationalized global working class. To Veronica Gargo, the uh, feminist theorist who contributed, who has contributed you know, to the theory of the women's strike, the strike she writes, and I quote, must account for the multiple level reality that escape the borders of wage and unionized work, that question the limit between productive and reproductive labor, formal and informal labor, remunerated and free task, between migrant and national labor, between the employed and the unemployed. The strike taken up by women movement directly target a central element of the capitalist system, the sexual and colonial division of labor. From the beginning, organizers of the strike in Argentina and Chile and mostly in South America thought to build alliance with uh, indigenous people fighting for the land rights or you know other uh, uh, sorry other community, and for instance in Argentina with the piqueteras, the movement of unemployed women that had been organizing neighborhood assemblies and street demonstration against neoliberalism. Dismantling the master house led to the intersection of gender violence and economic and social issue, and the issue, the larger issue of structural and systemic violence. I would like now to, to move to, to another example of you know, this question of dismantling of the uh, master house and the effort to develop pedagogy of decolonial and collective realization. And this is something you know, I've been doing. And I start, it start, I mean, it, it hard back to the toppling of statue in 2020. And you may remember that the first toppling of statue did not occur in Bristol on June 6, with the toppling of Carlson, of Edward Carlson, but in Martinique on May 22, 2020, even though the Martinique and event has remained practically invisible in mass media and even in uh, academic discussion. In Martinique, so young Martinique toppled two statues of Victor Schulcher, who was never a slave trader, nor a, a slave owner, nor a you know, rabid colonialist, but a good Republican who pushed for the abolition of slavery. And by these gestures, they wanted to say, abolition has not occurred. As abolition is, not, uh, is to be finished. We still are abolitionists. The toppling of uh, Victor Schelcher, that man, in Martinique uh, led to hostile reaction in France, but also in Martinique. So from that, we, I mean, with some uh, artist friend, we started to work on the question of a statue. And it was for me to work on the hostile environment of city, not just, I mean, the statue or the silent vigil of a bourgeois male city, inhospitable to migrant, to black and brown bodies, to women, to the elderly, to children, to refugee, to homeless people, to non-valid person. In France and in its current overseas department, cities, in fact, are cities that celebrate military colonial conquests and settlers. It's a city that is, in fact, uh, tracing a colonial architecture. 
So in this, you know, it was the question was how to decolonize the city and not just by toppling the statue, how to make it human, hospitable, to humanize the city. I suggested to organize what I call decolonial workshop in situ, going in front of a statue of a monument and there collectively developing a multifaceted, a wide range of reading of that statue, rethinking the past and its impact on the present, working with participants to discover their own preconceived idea, the way in which the past affect how we approach the very contemporary issue of extractivism, immigration and democracy. It's not just about the necessary restoration of a repressed past or hidden history. It called for question about the way in which the world is organized today and thus contribute to the struggle for the humanization of the world. And in fact, I mean, the, the place I, I, I pick up in Paris, you have what I call a colonial triangle at the Port Doré. Uh, you have first the statue of Paris, of France as Athena. On the left is the Museum of Na National History of Immigration. And on the right is a monument to Jean-Baptiste Marchand, who was uh, uh, an explorer, colonial explorer. And what is interesting is that the, this, uh, the museum was built in 1931 for the colonial exhibition at a moment when in fact the colonial empire, the French colonial empire was already you know, being very much attacked. So it was as a compensation for a moment of fragility that this huge monument you know, uh, building was made with all his uh, bas relief and all, all these things. So it's really very important to show that this huge monument is built at a moment of fragility. But on the surface, I don't know if you know the museum, I wanted to show a picture, but uh, what? And on, you, it's pe people at work, at work, constantly at work, and all the word, the name of the product that are extracted. And so on the right, the monument to Jean-Baptiste Marchand, it's the monument to a man. In fact, it's before 1931, but the monument was in fact erected much later. And this is someone who went from Congo to the Nile and uh, through all his, uh, itinerary left behind him, burn villages, uh, uh, was, you know, the rape of women, women young, even as young girl as 12, were forced to spend the night with the officer and all this. But the build, I mean, the monument was also put, uh, erected in 1949, after the already the prizing in Selma and Ghanif in Algeria in 1945, the insurrection in Madagascar in 1947, and the war of independence in Indochina, which has started. So again, a very fragile moment for the colonialism and the compensation by this building. But the connection is also the fact that without the army entering, you don't have the extraction. And the, the parallel that can be made with today, the presence of French army in Africa and the necessary extraction to come to France and you know, bring much more wealth to France. So in that uh, decolonial work in situ, this is what is being you know, explained, but then it's also to cover the monument and then to bring back the name of the African, those who resisted against you know, Marchand exploration in the 19th century, but also during the construction uh, during 1931, this name which are totally erased and that to bring them back rather than the name. So it's not just toppling this monument, but it's also in the living to transform them, in fact, to, do, to take power out of them, you know, to make them just piece of stone or of bronze, just, you know, let, let them become roots. And then to bring back in fact, the life and energy of the current struggle, of the current struggle for humanizing the world and for imagining together, together, you know, what will come later. To nurture utopian thinking, to absolutely affirm constantly that there is an alternative, that there is a possibility and to think historically in the present that it is possible. Thank you. Well, there was a question about what's happening in Senegal. Um, and if I have thought about the situation, but what I understand is, you know, the, this long uh, problem in Senegal with uh, the dependency on, on France, you know, with the France CFA, but also about what the, the, the illusion of democracy Senegal presenting itself for a long time as the only democratic, practically the only democratic uh, 
state in Africa, whereas there was no independence of justice and there was a lot of corruption and there was a lot of poverty and people are reacting. It's not the first time that we have a, a, an important demonstration in Senegal in Dakar, uh, the, the way in which effectively uh, there is uh, young people find no work, the university is being, uh, you know, has difficulty. Um, uh, the, uh, so many also young Senegalese try to uh, to escape Senegal and, and die in the Atlantic or in the Mediterranean. So the accumulation of anger and frustration, um, the fact that you know the new a new city is being built uh, by the airport very far from the old Dakar, where in the bourgeoisie and the administration and the government will be, and so the deep separation also again with the people. So all this, I mean, a lot, a lot, the violence against women, um, all this, I think, uh, and, and and the fact that more and more young Senegalese are, uh, of course, there has been always an awareness and very strong opposition for a long time in uh, Senegal, uh, but uh, more effectively, the situation is more and more un unbearable. So there is uh, anger and this is totally understandable. And the manipulation instrumentation. I mean, the, in, the, in the case that you're talking about right now, there is also the instrumentation of justice and the question of violence against women that mixing together in different way. Hello. Sorry, I have to tell you <laughs> to take my glasses. Do you think it's possible to decolonize an institution that's originally rooted in colonialism? The example, for instance, and how can platform bring together artists and scholars to thinking about this issue? And how do we move from programmer in the art? Okay, um, yeah, but platform, I mean, platform bringing together artists and scholars already exists all over the all, all over the world. So that, that's possible. I think it's, a, I mean, a lot of artists are doing also research and, and vice versa. I mean, there are bridges constantly. Uh, I mean, I, I can speak for myself. I mean, I have been doing for many years now what I call l'atelier to say, I mean, which is the translation of the workshop, but we mean it's not let the, the, work, the atelier of the artist. It's the atelier where we, you, know, you work collectively, where people will work collectively. And it's always with artists, scholars, and activists. And, and now, since uh, Kader Atia, the Franco-Algerian artist, uh, where, uh, was forced to close the place he had opened in Paris called La Colonie, uh, which was a very uh, an important place in Paris because we are missing, missing really place. I, I close, uh, we, uh, with him, I'm organizing what we call uh, La Colonie Nomade, and which is gonna be, which gonna start in April and will be in fact uh, with artists, uh, uh, scholars and activists together to think about repair, the question of reparation, uh, and even you know, more uh, so with, uh, with the moment of the pandemic and the increase of poverty and stress and mental suffering that this is bringing. So what is to repair? And to think about repair, not in the sense of the West. I mean, I, I don't know if you know Kader Atia work, but uh, Kader work about the fact that usually in the West you want to erase uh, the, the wound, you, you want to erase the scar, so all the question of, you know, of a surgery, and that the fact that, uh, in fact, to keep this, to show the scar, the scars and to make and to think about the repair. So we're going to work also with a migrant and association of migrant and some uh, psychoanalysts also from some days and work also with the uh, uh, association because we're going to be in a popular neighborhood just uh, by Paris and to work also with these people. So it's it has to be experimented and it's I don't think there was a model, but you have to have a topic and with this topic, through that topic to work with people and to be able to constantly assess what is being done and perhaps to think, oh, we, we thought we we're going to do that, but we, we have to change it because through the conversation, we see that it did not fit, it does not really work. So this is not school that, you know, we have to follow a program to that lead to whatever, to an exam. It's really, it can be, you know, uh, transformed. It's in practice, really in practice. So uh, it can be, you know, even we say, oh, by the third uh, session, we will do that. And the second session show differences, we can change it. So this is how uh, myself I will decolonize the institution. Well, most institutions uh, originally are rooted in colonialism. So I will say 
with institution, I don't think there is one, I mean, there are institution I think it's impossible to work with. And the institution for me is a, is a whole social world. It's not just, you know, who we see, not just the direction of the curators, but who is cleaning the place, who is guarding the place, who is working in the, in the restaurant and who is who are the secretary. Do we have sexual and racial harassment? Do we have, you know, some discrimination? So, for me, the decolonization of the, of this is is a whole uh, of the whole structure, and it cannot be outside of what's happening because even decolonizing a museum, I mean, you you may have followed the whole debate on the restitution of object and quite difficult in France. But even even if let's say uh, the Musée du Quai Branly was uh, returning. Um, all the objects looted in Africa and elsewhere, which mean the practically, you know, all the 80% of the, what they have, uh, will uh, it will not decolonize the, the museum. The museum will still remain, you know, in its philosophy, in its, you know, objective uh, a colonial institution. So this has to be changed and has to be changed with the, with everything around. And also because some of the museums today that are constructed in popular neighborhood are there to uh, accelerate gentrification. So we have to be uh, aware of, of all this. Um, Hello, programming. How can artists drop the idea of dismantling in the way that they produce work in uh, I don't, I don't, Denise, I don't quite understand your question. I'm sorry. How can artists and cultural practitioners develop, that's it, the idea, in the way that produce work and engage with community? I, I'm not sure. So if you can, you know, reformulate it so I can answer more. Uh, do you think the latest incident of a Black Lives Matter, for example, in the UK, removal of Trada and colonial figure could be considered as a movement? Yes, it's part of decolonizing the city. It cannot be uh, just that, you know, for instance, uh, I've been following uh, decolonize the city in New York and the fact that they will fight also against the cost of trans public transportation, the policing of street. Uh, and etc. Because there was, I mean, there, there may be this trap. I mean, in France, there was a little, oh, you want us to replace the statue of whomever white men with, for instance, Caesar. And I say, we don't want to, you know, to multiply statue by, I replace by statue. It's like, how do we work memory in the public space? How do we work that history in the public space? And so perhaps it will be, there are, there are some statues that take away with a statue and put a garden, I don't know, put trees and, and benches so people can, uh, you know, rest sometimes. There was no possibility of resting. And, on, uh, and also it, it's interesting to see where are the statue and compare with what's happening in a popular neighborhood where the monuments are quite often memorial to, uh, uh, to the victim of police violence. And these are monuments. So this is another aesthetic of monument, and these are public monuments. They are in the public space, and they remind people, or for instance, what people fight to have uh, something that uh, commemorate uh, um, a working class uprising or demonstration by migrant or demonstration against uh, uh, colonial war, and that's part of uh, also th of rethinking the public space in a decolonial way. Um, so I'm not. So how do we move programmer of the art? Well, uh, by working, uh, uh, what what would be for you uh, the decolonization of your own practice? Uh, in in which way your practice? The, the, the question of decolonization is not is not something. It's not a program out there. It's first to decolonize ourselves. You know, in which way? What MSA had called the return effect of slavery and colonialism. The, the fact that we are, or what Fano uh, discussed in Black Skin, what mass, the fact that none of us escaped this. So, how it enters in our mind, in the way we look at the world and we see the world. So, that's already. And so, it's not just diversity and inclusivity, you know, to be sure that we have, a, a, in, you know, enough representative for different people, but really in, in, in terms of difficult confrontation with uh, what has happened. And so, there was, I will not say, it's, uh, it's every time it's a new, uh, it's, it's a new uh, journey. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, I cannot find my word now. And uh, so every time you, we are confronted, so you are programming something. So what are you doing? In which way? Uh, what are the references? Uh, what are the objective? Um, with whom? And it's not just bringing, you know, some association, some migrant association. 
as a token or you know some other association or collective as token but really um thinking thinking through and i don't think that one institution will say that, i mean we'll be able to do things without you know connection with other institutions in space that we are not you know we are not uh, separated from that uh, So if I understand again, you know, how can artists and decor the idea of dismantling in the way they produce work and engage with? It? Okay. Well, dismantling the master house, it's it's a long process. It's not, not gonna happen tomorrow, right? It's not, it's really a long process. And it's always um, um when I when I use the word of marooning, it's like to how do I escape also in my mind uh the the incredible uh, uh weight and strength of the uh, master ideology. How I do rethink the geography. As I say, for instance, the, 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 the way in which the master house try to expand its, its world. I mean, because for the master house to survive, it has to have with it, as I say, connection with the global world. It could not be just on its place there. It has to be connected with bank and share you know, uh, law, international law and other things, and also inside, you know, all this rule. So there are many ways to attack the master house and it can be effectively those who are forbidden to circulate and who are threatened with death if they, if they transgress uh, that interdiction, well, to facilitate their circulation. That can be one, you know, like uh, that can be done. Or this, for instance, women, the, the women strike. I've been working, uh, uh, you know, sporting uh, cleaners, women uh, cleaners uh, striking in Paris since July 2019. And, and it's like, they are incredibly courageous. And so it's like to, to see with them, what do they need? And to put myself, okay, if you need that, I'm gonna try to do it. Um, is to listening, to listening a lot to the first, to the people with whom we want to work or we or what they are doing interests us, um, because they know what they need, they do know, uh, and so uh, so it, it's, it has to be, it does not need to be formulated in a sophisticated way. This is it's very strong. It's very um, as soon as this. Uh, uh, women and men on whom uh, on on whose body uh, the power and the wealth rest, you know, uh, withdraw and or strike. Uh, the repression is so harsh because it shows that it's really really threatening. It's not it's not um, it, it's it's not just the idea, you know. It's really threatening, and I, I do think that, for instance, the patriarchal backlash today uh, against women, the fact that even you will have leaders calling publicly for the rape of activist uh, leaders, I mean, female activist leaders, or even killing them, of course, uh, you know, encouraging their murder, show how much they, they fear this, um, this movement, how much is, they are really afraid because uh, to maintain the master house and its world, uh, it's a daily, daily, daily work of uh, censorship, terror, repression. Otherwise, it will crumble. It will crumble. Okay, so um, I, I want to thank you for your question and for listening. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank uh, you know, to everyone and uh, to Sana, Alia, and Hassan, and, and everyone at the March meeting uh, who invited me to speak today.